stand up and sing with us. Church, sing, you stay.
Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. He's just faithful, and he's great. If we could do it ourselves, we wouldn't need him. We wouldn't need to, to praise him. We wouldn't need to worship him. But he deserves our praise. He doesn't need us, but he wants us. That's our God. He is the mighty God of the universe. And wherever he says we go, that's where we go. The people he says to love, that's who we love. And for 
God so loved the world. If he loves the world, I think we should too. We're here to worship. Won't you just pray with me for a moment? Lord, we ask you to enter the room. We just ask you to uh, take everything we have to offer, Lord. You've given it to us so we can give it back. We lift everything up in the name of Jesus Christ. May this service be blessed in your name and for you alone. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to welcome all our first-time visitors out there. If you're new here, first Sunday, in the back of your bulletins, there's a little visitor's card. You can tear it out. Take about a minute and a half to fill it out for us. At the end of the service, you can go back to our welcome booth in the foyer. We're going to have a little gift for you. So, hey, find somebody new this morning, guys. Go across the room. Do what you got to do. Shake some hands this morning. Hey, guys. This is Peyton Neal, worship pastor at Central Baptist Church in Tyler. Check us out Sunday mornings at 945 for our small group Bible studies, as well as our 1045 worship service. If you need more information, feel free to visit us at www.centraltyler.org or if you need more information, just check out the number below. Thank you for watching the video of our service today. We would love to see you here soon. I know you know what's singing out to me. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun. Yeah. 
us a lot upon a hill. We're supposed to shine His light. And we're supposed to shine His love. And Really, this is speaking for the church. It's, it's time to shine. It's time to shine God's love. He's already shining. It's time for us to display it. It's displayed through us. And when you, when you seek it, we can speak the message over people. In Psalm 90, Psalm 91, He says that He is our refuge. And our God is a great God. And no enemy can stand against Him. It's just, it's just straight scripture. It's nothing that we could come up with ourselves. I mean, it's just from the Bible. Let's go read it. But I just feel like it's just the message you want to display. It's time to lift his name up. And it's time to shine his light for the people. I just, I just wanted to sing that with you guys. If you'll stand and sing it with us. Sing it together. Time to shine. Light of the world. From the sky, your grace falls down. Let hope arise. Let's sing that again. Time to shine. Time to shine. Light of the world. From the sky, your grace falls down. Let hope arise, fill with love, fill with love, our walls came in, nothing can stand, oh mighty defense, let hope arise. Your name, refuge from the enemy, stronghold of mighty strength, hiding place of love and peace. Fill us with your hope, fill us with your hope Yes, yes. 
place of love and peace. Fill us with your hope. Fill us with your hope today. God, even in this world, no matter what comes our way, God, no matter the amount of evil, the amount of pain, or hurt, God, we can proclaim that there is hope. Because you are alive and well. You are alive. And as long as there's light upon the darkness, God, there's always hope. You've already defeated death. Let's sing that one more time together. Let's make it our prayer. That our God is our hope. Sing it. Sing greatness is your name. Refuge from the enemy, strong cold of mighty strength, hiding place of love and peace. Fill us with your hope, fill us with your hope
So oh God, carry us in your arms. It's faithful. Would you bow your heads with me, Lord? I just feel like you give me a word that I just need to speak. There's a never lack of hope. the name of Jesus is involved. There's always hope. You never fail, ever. In the history of the universe, you have never failed. You are the God, it says in the scriptures, Lord, you're the God that created the heavens first, and then he stretched them out. As he just said, go. He stretched them out. Imagine the universe in the span of your hand. There's always hope. We have a God as mighty as you. Let our hope be in you, Lord. All of our hope. Lord Jesus, can you can just convict us of your love? Just show us the greatness of it. Let the conviction be so great, God. We can't help but surrender to your love. We're just so thankful, God, that you do lead us. Just so faithful. Even when we were unfaithful, you remain faithful. God, open our hearts. Show us something new. Show us. Take us deeper, God. Help us to grow in your love and your name right now. We just give you everything that we have. And we're just grateful for the ability to sing out, God. We've been blessed with that. And I pray we just give it back to you. And for that we have ears to listen right now. And we give our minds and our hearts to you. All these words for you. So in the name of Jesus, we'll always pray. Amen. It says, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing 
that those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even if we had believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Now, I want to talk about confronting error, and I want you to understand this passion in the life of Paul and why this whole thing took place. Here you have a, a powerful face-to-face -face confrontation between two of the main leaders of the church, Paul and Peter, and it had to do with how they were going to treat Gentile converts. Now, again, you've got to remember that the majority of the church was Jewish, Jewish by birth, Jewish by nature, Jewish by tradition. Christ had come and showed them a new way, a life by faith. And so they turned away from the law and they embraced faith. And Paul had this powerful feeling about it because Paul had been a dedicated Jew. That, that doesn't even say it. It's to say he was a dedicated Jew is like saying that LeBron James is a pretty good basketball player. I mean, it, it's just not even conveying the depth of the, the, what's involved. Paul was totally, in every area of his life, 100% a dedicated Jew. If there was any kind of Jewish tradition, any kind of Jewish teaching, any kind of means of getting into heaven by being a follower of the law, a good Jew, Paul had it nailed. But he had an experience with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus that showed him that all of that was loss. All of that was like a pile of trash compared to the excellency of knowing Christ as Savior. And he turned away from the law as a means of getting to heaven. And he turned to salvation in Christ. And he wrote these words, For by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so that was Paul's message. You get saved. You get the ticket to heaven. You get your sins forgiven through faith in Christ, not by good works, not by keeping the law. And he spent his life teaching that and preaching that. And thousands of people got saved following that. And the church embraced that. It was the teaching of Christ. But every time Paul turned around, somebody was trying to drag Christians back under the teaching of Judaism. Somebody was trying to mix law with grace. And so Paul's passion and what turned him into a shouter of the gospel was, quit messing up the truth that I've given you. Quit dragging us back down that road. I want to ask you a question because we're going to talk about confronting error. Have you ever taught somebody something and helped them understand something good only to have them drift away from it, and you have to go back and teach them again? Have you ever had to do that? Have you ever had that experience of giving somebody good information, and you try to confront an error, and then they get it for a little while, and then the first thing you know, they start going right back down that old path, and you find yourself going right back into that argument? Anybody had that experience? I just want to know, anybody? Well, some of you are just not natural known teachers. Now, I'm going to say this, and I don't want you to assume this, but I read about a man somewhere, heard about a man somewhere that tried to teach his wife how to drive. Now, you're not to assume this is me. But this guy 
had noticed that his wife drove with both feet on the brake. You know, or no, she had one foot on the gas, but she would rest her foot on the brake. Don't assume. And so she would drive like that. And you know, you can't do that. If you rest your foot on the brake while you're driving, what happens, mechanics? What happens? What, you wear out the brake. Isn't that right? So you can't do that. So if any of you do that, stop it. <laughs> stop right now. It's bad for your car. Anybody look at somebody in your family that's doing that and say, stop it. Okay, I'm just saying. So, but then you get them clear on that, and then uh, and you go, think you got it all settled, and you turn around, and there it's happening. Oh, I, this person I read about. You turn around, and there it's happening all over again, right? And you get right back into the same thing again. Apostle Paul, that's the way he must have felt. He preaches salvation of grace. You find your way to heaven through the unmerited favor of God. You didn't do a thing to earn it. Christ died on the cross because we couldn't earn it. He gives us free salvation. It's not cheap because he paid for it with his life, but it is free for by grace are you saved. And what's the criteria? It's faith, and people get saved by faith. And every time he turns around, they start trying to drag him back to law. So we need to talk about being confronters of error. It is the nature of every human interaction that there will be occasional flaws. Our innate confusion as human beings, uh, you know, we're often confused, right? We're, we're confused a lot of the time. It's like the guy who had a sign and he was standing there and said, I am confused, K-O-N-F-U-S-E-D, I am confused. And somebody said, you don't spell confusion with a K. He said, that's how confused I am. But most of the time, we're confused. Our innate confusion, especially about spiritual things, means we can easily get off track. Paul was determined that the grace he taught so freely would not be watered down or diluted. Now, he spent his life trying to bring clarity to several errors. One, the paganism that was rampant in Roman culture. Secondly, the pantheism, a little bit different thing, that drew attention and honor away from Christ, that God is everywhere and in everything, and he said, no, he's, he, Christ is everything. But seemingly, his greatest struggle was to keep religious leaders, people who knew Christ, many of them, from turning the gospel of grace into a works religion. And Paul continued to be a shouter of the gospel because of the attacks on grace he saw in the early church. Listen, there's just some things we have to live and die on. And church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to die on this mountain. The way to heaven is faith in Jesus Christ without any works attached to it. We have to die on that mountain. That's what Jesus brought us. That's the truth. And you know the church, and I'm talking the church generic, the church universal has through the centuries just mucking it up. They keep trying to drag something along with it. They keep saying, yes, you get saved in Christ, but you've got to have all these rituals of the church you also keep. No, you don't. You get saved by faith in Jesus Christ. You know, no, you get saved by Jesus in Christ. People say, it's faith in Christ that saves you. But then you've got to also be baptized. No, you don't. You need to be baptized because it's the right thing to do. But you get saved by faith in Christ. That's what saves you. Well, you get saved by faith in Christ, people say. But once you get saved, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, and you've got to do this, and you got to, and they got this long list, and I'm going to say to you, no, that's not true. You may not want to do certain things once you're saved, and you may need to stop doing certain things because it's not good for your testimony, but that is not what's going to get you into heaven. You get saved by faith in Jesus Christ. It's a gift of God. You embrace Him by faith, and that's all it takes. That's all it'll ever take, and you can't add to it. And we cannot let people add to it. And that was the argument of Christ. I mean, Paul, that was his argument his whole life. Every time he turned around, it was happening again. Paul's boldness for the truth, he confronts Peter to his faith in, in our text here in Galatians because Peter had been eaten with the Gentiles like there was no problem. Gentile converts and some of the Jews come up from Jerusalem and he's afraid to be seen with them. And he said, I got in his face. And I said, what are you doing, Peter? You're trying to drag these people back under the law. He battled on the behalf of Gentile converts to Christianity in the Jerusalem Council. We're going to look at that a little more in 
fact, if you want to turn to Acts chapter 15, we'll see that passage. He deliberately debated the Jewish leaders and every synagogue he visited throughout his entire preaching career about this issue. It's salvation and faith. Now, realize he's preaching this against 1,700 years of teaching of salvation by law. Temple observance, ritual observance, feast day observances, dress observances, uh, dietary observance, all this law for 1,700 years. And Jesus comes and says, all of that law is for a purpose. It's good. It needs to be honored, but it's not going to save you. In fact, it'll either cause you to see that you have no hope of heaven and you die frustrated or you'll get proud and you'll never reach out to God because you'll be too full of pride. But either way, the law will not save you. You must have a Savior, and I am the Savior. He protected and promoted young Timothy as a protege, even though he was a Gentile convert. And that was a scandal because Timothy was a, he had a, a Jewish mother, but he had a Greek father. And as a, as a result, he had not been raised in Judaism and he had not fulfilled the requirements of circumcision. And when Timothy started being Paul's right-hand preacher boy, Paul promoted him, even though some of the Jewish leaders said, nope, you can't do that. He has, he's not a good Jew. He's not been circumcised. And Paul said, I'm telling you, it's not about being a good Jew. It's about salvation in Jesus Christ. And he kept battling for that. In Acts chapter 15, look at his battles for the truth. First is stand at Jerusalem Council. Most of you may not know about the Jerusalem Council. You probably don't care a whole lot about it. On the list of things that, that you think are important in your life, you probably don't think this is a big one, but it was huge. What happened is, uh, you find in Acts 15, 1, certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, why, what's going on? Paul has been sent out. He and other uh, uh, leaders have been sent out to preach the gospel of salvation in Christ, and they are having great success in Antioch. Hundreds of people are coming to faith. All kinds of people are coming to faith. Jews are coming to faith, but a lot of Gentiles are coming to faith. Greeks and Romans and other uh, uh, nationalities, and of course, they don't have Jewish customs. And so they, they're taught that Christ is the way of salvation. You get saved by taking Christ as your Savior. And these guys and women, men and women had gotten saved, and the church was booming. Now, that remember, the central part of the church was at Jerusalem or Judea. Some leaders came down from Judea to teach the brethren all these new converts. And what do they do? They start dragging them right back into the law. They stand up and they say, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses or the law, you cannot be saved. And Paul flipped his wig. Paul just had a good old-fashioned hissy fit. And Paul said, we're not doing that. We've already been down that road. If anybody could be saved by works, it was me. If anybody was a good Jew and could get saved, I was it. That won't work. It's Jesus alone that saves you. So what do they do? What do good, good Christians do when they got a difference of opinion? They get on the phone and gossip about each other. <laughs> but because phones hadn't been invented or Facebook, they had a meeting a council in Jerusalem. And they called the leaders of the church together and said, we got a problem here. We got some good Jewish believers, good, dedicated Jewish believers. We got some great new converts who are Gentiles. And these Jewish believers think they ought to follow the law as well as Jesus. And Paul and some of the others think we ought to just follow Jesus and not tack on the law. So let's have a discussion. And so they have a discussion. The people that were promoting following of the law plus Jesus were called Judaizers. Judaizers. They believed Christ was the Savior by faith, but they also believed those converts had to keep the Jewish law as well. It's the feast days, the temple worship, circumcision, all this other stuff. So they have a meeting. The Judaizers speak first. They demand the circumcision of Jew Gentile converts. James is leading this meeting. That must have been an interesting meeting. That was one you wouldn't have stayed home from. You'd have been there that day because they were all having a big debate. 
James lets the Judaizers speak for us, and that's their point. Yep, we know Jesus is a Savior, but hey, we are the seed of Moses and Abraham, and we are the Jewish people. We've always had these traditions. They've got to do it too. Peter gets up, to his credit, and relates an incredible experience he has where he is confronted by God in a dream not to call what God has called holy unclean, and that enables him to go to his first Gentile convert, Cornelius, a Roman centurion, and that Cornelius gets saved and his followers get saved, and they get filled with the Holy Spirit. So Peter says, baptize them, because it's obvious they're filled with the Holy Spirit. They're obviously saved, baptize them. And so he says, it's obvious that God is saving Gentile converts who have no understanding of the law at all. Then Paul and Barnabas speak about the work at Antioch among the Gentiles. And then they make a decision. What do we have to do? Now you say, I don't care about any of that. I just want to get the lubies for lunch. Well, listen. Here's the thing. That decision is why you are not wearing phylacteries on your wrist and on your forehead as Christians. Why you're not, some of you will eat catfish for lunch and some of you may have shrimp and that'll be okay. And why you're not having to wear a robe with tassels on the end of your, go- your garment so you don't forget the law, and why you don't have to go to Jerusalem once a year to make your sacrifice at the tabernacle in the temple. What? No, the point is this. Listen, the point is, are we going to be Jews plus Jesus, or are we going to be Christians with a Jewish heritage? And guess who won? We're going to be Christians with a Jewish heritage. So they said three things, okay? Tell them they don't have to worry about getting circumcised. That must have been a big whoo to the guys at Antioch. <laughs> you don't know what I'm talking about, look it up later. <laughs> okay. They don't have to get circumcised. But there were three things they had to do. He said, I want them to abstain from things offered to idols. Abstain from strangled animals in their blood, and blood in food, no drinking or eating blood products, and abstain from sexual immorality, and other than that, follow Jesus, follow Jesus, and do the work. That's the reason I get, oh, I'm getting in trouble here. I got to be so careful. It's amazing how much trouble I can get into. But occasionally I run into Christian people who have been saved by grace and Jesus, and they know He's the means of salvation. And somebody, the first thing I know, they're wanting to keep the feast or the tabernacles, or they're wanting to follow some Jewish dietary law, or they're wanting to do this or that. And, the Jew, and listen, as much respect and admiration as we must always have for our Jewish tradition, we are not Jews. We are Christians. We are Christians. And our first allegiance is to Christ. And we get saved through faith in Christ. If you want to follow Jewish dietary laws because you think they're healthier, go for it. But don't tack it on to whether or not you're a good Christian because it has nothing to do with your Christianity. That little extra didn't cost you anything in the sermon. I just threw that in. (laughs) Galatians chapter 3. Let me give you two summaries of Paul's uh, statement, and then I'm going to give you some application. Galatians chapter 3. Paul summarizes his position on faith versus the law. In the 3, verse 1, Oh, foolish Galatians, because this is what was happening in Galatia. They were trying to drag them back under the law. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth. We're in verse 1 of chapter 3 of Galatians. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of the faith? <laughs> Paul's blunt, isn't he? How did you get saved? Did you get saved by keeping the law, or did you get saved by faith in Jesus Christ? That's what that verse is asking. Well, obviously, they got saved by faith in Christ, because that's what he preached to them. So he says in verse 3, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. 
and the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preaching the gospel to Abraham beforehand, said, And you all the nations shall be blessed, so then those who are of faith are blessed by believing in Abraham. And then, then skip down to chapter 5, verse 1 through 6. He says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty with which you have been made free. Stand your ground in the freedom of Christ, by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempted to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For though we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness, my faith, for in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through Christ. Well, we could spend a whole another hour doing this, but here's the thing. Let me summarize. Salvation begun in faith cannot be perfected by the law. It is begun by faith. It is perfected by faith. Abraham, the hero of Judaism, was made righteous in the sense that he believed God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. So if you want to count yourself a Jew, recognize the foundations of Judaism are faith. And it was faith that justified Abraham. The law brings a curse on its follower. Curse it is the law because it's the schoolmaster. It shows you that you're a sinner. The law was a schoolmaster in verse 24 of chapter 3 that showed you that you need salvation and you should stand firm in the faith with which God has made you free. This is our mountain to die on. Listen to me, church. We can change a lot of stuff. And we do it all the time. In fact, the, this is one church where, the, where change just doesn't happen in the nursery. It happens all over the place. We change all the time. All this time, we'll do whatever we need to do. But listen, there's some things we got to die on. We have to die on this salvation by faith and faith alone. Don't let that get watered down. And then chapter 2 of Ephesians, just one more summary and I'll, I'll make application. He says, he summarizes again his position that is salvation by faith. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, And you who he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, what you were before Christ, you were dead. You were dying. You were dead to God, dead in your trespasses and sin. And what you, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit which now worketh in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, just as others. He said, before Jesus, you were lost. Before Jesus, you were the sons of your father Satan before Jesus you were deceived you were controlled by sin controlled by lust the desires of the flesh you were by nature waiting for the wrath of God oh but look at verse 4 but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses made us alive together with Christ for by grace you have been saved wow and raised us up together, made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works. I see any man should boast. Listen, listen to me. Christians ought to live holy lives. Christians ought to be dedicated to come to church. Christians ought to be givers. Christians ought to be, uh, share their faith. Christians ought to stand for righteousness. Christians ought to be light and salt in the community. But I'm going to tell you, all of those ought to's are not requirements in order to go to heaven. What's required in order to go to heaven is a personal experience whereby you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior from sin and His righteousness, not your righteousness, His righteousness is applied to your sin because by faith, you get saved through the grace of God. And that was Paul's position. And thank God for it. I heard it when I was 12, and I needed it. Now, I, I just wish some of you, I don't know how some of you are so self-righteous. I don't mean that in a nice way. I mean, I'm not picking on you. I mean, you're nice, nice self-righteous. I don't mean you're holier than thou and all that, but you're just kind of comfortable with yourself. 
I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. I'm, I think I'm okay. I talk to people all the time. I say, if you died today, would you go to heaven? Oh, I think I'm pretty good. Really? You really think so? Oh, I haven't, I haven't done any really terrible things, Pastor. And I once helped a little old lady across the street with her groceries. I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not a drunk. I'm not a drug addict. I've never been to prison. I'm, I'm pretty good. I don't beat my wife. She doesn't beat me. I'm, I mean, we're doing pretty good. Really? I, just, I never felt that comfortable. You know, I, you know I, I, I meet people like that, and I go, really? You really feel that good about it? Because, you know, I see I had a whole other experience. I, I had a terrible uh, year, the year I was 12, and a, and a wonderful year. I, I, I got in some trouble. I stole a bicycle. I don't have time to tell you the whole wonderful story of it. <laughs> but I know that someday out on the sign we're going to put a golden bicycle because it's a great story. But anyway, I stole this bicycle. And uh, it was culmination, unfortunately, a lot of stealing. And I, and I, I mean, you know, I was a thief. You know, I just never felt like I'm okay. You know, if, 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 you know it's pretty clear. One of the ten, I broke one of the top ten. I mean, my, mine's not even negotiable. Thou shalt not steal. Well, I'm toast, right? Because I'm a thief. So, um, I never really felt so comfortable as some of you seem to feel. Oh, I'm all right. I'm okay. I think I'm fine. I never felt that way. I knew better. I knew if I had to stand before a holy God, a God who has no sin and is too holy to be in the presence of sin, oh, this thief had no hope. Now, you may feel pretty comfortable with that. You know, you, you may feel comfortable with me standing up here. Here's Kim Beckham. I don't feel bad standing beside that preacher. I'm as good as that preacher. Well, that's easy. I'm a thief. Or was a thief. I got I to gotta make that clear. I was a thief. <laughs> but here's, here's the other thing. What if Jesus was here? What if Jesus Christ was here? No sin. Can he be, be in the presence of sin? Sin has to flee from him. Demons have to flee at the very sound of his name. He is so holy. He burns with the light of holiness. And you can sit right there and, and say, yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Okay. Yeah, me and Jesus, we're like that. No, you're not. You're not. Your soul is doomed. You are dead in your trespasses and sin. You're filled with a false self-righteousness. There is no, and I, you say, well, that's harsh. I'm just going to tell you what the book says. The book says, for there is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you may not be as bad a sinner as me. That's negotiable. But you're a sinner, and you need a Savior. And thank God a Savior has come. But once you receive that Savior by faith, don't let them drag you back under the law. Don't do it. We're saved by grace and faith. All right, how should we stand for the truth? And I'll close. One, with humility, remembering our weakness. Now, even though Paul withstood Peter to the face, that must have been an interesting conversation in front of them all. <laughs> that was fun. But when he went, but he still followed the, the, the right order of things, and he went back to Jerusalem, and he went to the council, and he didn't demand to get to run the council, and didn't pick up his crayons and go home. Paul was still a follower of the rules with humility, remembering your weakness. How do you stand with that? Do you, have any, you know anybody that's practicing error right now? And I don't mean that in an ugly way. Somebody you care about, but they're deceived and they're caught up in it. How do you share with them? With humility, with deep humility, remembering that you have your own weaknesses. Uh, you know, the Apostle Paul made a terrible mistake about a young man named John Mark. And he was really harsh with John Mark because John Mark, on the, one of their missionary journeys, wanted to go home early. It was hard. He wanted to go home early and got ready to take the second missionary journey. And his uncle wanted to take him. And, and Paul said, Ain't, I'm sorry, that was terrible English. There is no way we're taking that quitter with us. And he drew a line in the sand, and it split up the fellowship between the two of them. And later, later, late, thank God, later in life, Paul writes to Mark, 
bring John Mark to me. He's profitable to me in the gospel. He made a mistake. He was too harsh, and he had to live with that. You ever, have you ever made a mistake? Yeah. I do this in my class the other day. Let me help some of you here today. I want to, I want to practice this. It'll get easier. I want you to say this with me. I was wrong. Some of you just squirming already, but now are you ready? Okay, I just want you to say it with me. Come on, one, two, three. I, one more time. I was wrong. Because you know what? Sometimes you are. And so am I. And so we have to show great humility in confronting error because we can be wrong. Number two, with gentleness. How do we confront error? With gentleness, not allowing our passion to become aggression. Some of you have had people who don't believe in the things of God get in your face and get ugly. They've called you as followers of God. They've ridiculed your faith. They've attacked you online, Facebook or whatever. They said horrible things about our Savior. You know, we've all seen that in the media, and it happens. So how do we deal with that? Well, 2 Timothy 2, Paul would write this in verse 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle toward all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to acknowledging the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. He said, be gentle in your... Don't get aggressive. Be gentle... Strive with men with kindness and gentleness. Let your answers be soft. Doesn't mean you don't say the truth, but do it with patience and kindness and gentleness and leave the door open so that they can come back and talk to you again. (laughs) One time, and I appreciate anybody trying to do anything for the Lord, but we were out trying to tell people about Christ. And well, no, 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 there's a whole other thing. I had a friend of mine, his mother in law, he got saved. And his, his, his mother-in-law had not yet met Christ. And he wanted me to come talk to his mother-in-law and tell her how to meet Jesus as her Savior. And so we, sent, we sit down at the table. First thing out of his mouth, we sit down at the table and he says, tell this old bat why she's bound for the hot hell. <laughs> it's not really the tact to take in that. Thankfully, the Lord was bigger than that, and she did come to Christ. Listen, we should strive with gentleness and meekness for adventure, God will open the door. And the last thing, we, when we confront error, we do it with a determination to honor God above all. Not to salve our own ego, not to boost our own sense of intellectual skill or greatness, not to prove ourselves right in everybody, with a deep desire to honor God above all that I want God to be honored by this conversation. I want God to be honored about what we're doing here today. Sometimes being a shouter of the gospel means confronting error. How are you doing in that area? Let's stand to our feet as we close this service. Hi, my name's Kim Beckham, and I'm the pastor of Central Baptist Church. Thanks for tuning in today and being a part of this worship service. I hope you found the message helpful and the worship inspiring. If you don't have a church home, please come check us out on a Sunday soon. If you should have any question about today's message or just want to talk about spiritual things in general, please check us out on our website and email us or call us at Central Baptist Church, 903-561-6361. So glad you are a part of the worship today. Come see us soon. God bless you.